The base is dropped on a new edition of Soccer Down here. It's December 11th. There is news around Major League Soccer. We'll be getting into it this morning. We'll get into, honestly, wherever you want to take the conversation. We've got a couple very different kinds of questions this morning on a Wall Pass Wednesday. Wall Pass Wednesday, for those of you who are new to the show, basically you can ask whatever you want. And it can be historical, it can be about referees and laws of the game, we've got a question in that regard, it can be about the youth side, we've got a question that'll take us down that pathway, it can be MLS and silly season, it can also be lower divisions and big picture stuff and small picture stuff and wherever you want to take it. That's what a wall pass Wednesday is all about. You give us the question, you give us that pass, we'll try to give you the, the through ball back in so the goal can be scored but we don't make any guarantees. We just do the best we can. So we'll get into all that this morning as we go. Jason Longshore, John Nelson here with you this morning. And John, the big headline news of the day is Alan Polito, golden boot winner in Liga MX for Chivas de Guadalajara last season, is headed to Sporting Kansas City. Polito had been linked to San Jose and Chicago, both in pretty strong ways. Kansas City made the late run out of the back of the pack. And they get the number nine that they've been looking for for, honestly, a few years now since they traded Dom Dwyer to Orlando. And spent uh, a fair amount of money to, to br- get it done and bring him in. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what Polito can do in, in MLS in Kansas City. And my question for you is now with Polito, and this is assuming that Peter Vermes doesn't have the injuries that he had last year to the level that he did. But for those not following sporting 24-7, 365, with the addition of Polito in a healthy sense, what does sporting look like now when it comes to the Western Conference? If not the favorite, and I don't know if I would put them there over – an LAFC or a Seattle, and Seattle's still got a big question mark right now. For Seattle, favorite is in italics uh, as we wait and see what they're going to do with their roster because they are not fully stocked at the minute, and you, and you expect they're going to go out and spend, and, and Garth Lagerway has talked big about CONCACAF Champions League and the opportunity that it presents, so I don't think Seattle's just going to sit around and, and just throw guys into the the team as you know whoever's around I think they're going to go out and be aggressive but right behind LAFC as teams are currently constructed I think it's sporting I I think you look at the other teams in the west the galaxy right now are, are not set to be the galaxy that we saw last year they have not replaced Zlatan Ibrahimovic and that's a bunch of goals that walked out the door Minnesota has questions up top. They haven't upgraded from where they were. Portland hasn't upgraded from where they are. They've got questions up top. Kansas City's answered those questions up top. And it's it's a guy like Polito who comes in and gives you that number nine that you've needed. And he's not a traditional number nine. He's not just a number nine. He can play out wide. And that's going to give Peter Vermes a lot of flexibility. You know, Vermes is a guy who has been very consistent in playing a 4-3-3. I mean, to the point that it's been a large part of Sporting's branding over the last decade. You've got the opportunity now to maybe mix it up a little bit if you want to go with two up top. You've got more flexibility than you've had. Polito's not a Zlatan kind of striker where he is just going to be the, the tip of the attack and that's it. He can He can drift out wide. He can drop in a little bit deeper. He's a complete player. So how is Peter Vermes going to craft an attack to get the the best out of him? You look at the lineup right now that Sporting Kansas City can field. Tim Mealy in goal, one of the better goalkeepers in the league. Uh, Luis Martins, we'll I'll have to see some some you know answers about him. Uh, he was a late signing. Is he going to be able to be an upgrade from Seth Sinovic at left back? Center back, you've got a bunch of options. You've got Matt Beasler, you've got Andreo Fontas, you've got Botan Barat, you've got Graham Smith, you've added Roberto Puncek. You are potentially adding another center back. Sporting's linked to the captain of Vela Sarsfield. Okay, you're, you're, you're probably going to move at least one of those guys, and hey, Seattle might be calling because they need center backs, so maybe that's the deal you work out. 
right back, you've got Graham Zusi. You've got a midfield that you could potentially put out of Ilya Sanchez, Felipe Gutierrez, uh, some combination of Gianluca Busio, Roger Espinoza, uh, maybe Felipe Hernandez, who they signed late in the season from Swope Park. Maybe he makes that jump as his development has continued. You've got winger options in Gerso and Daniel Shallowy and Johnny Russell. Polito could play out wide. Kyrie Shelton could play out wide or as a number nine. Eric Hurtado can give you more of a big, strong number nine up top if you need a different look. You're, you're set. You've got a really good group and a lot of different ways to play. And the other thing about Kansas City, and, and you do have to factor this in, it's becoming a conversation in MLS. It, it, it is a conversation in leagues around the world. Sporting is not playing in Champions League this year. They did not right. go into the playoffs. They are going to have a group that is fully rested. They're not going to be distracted, especially early in the season. I don't, I'm don't. i pretty sure they're not even in League's Cup because of where they finished last year with all the injuries. So you've got a sporting team that's going to be able to just focus on league play. And other teams, other top teams in the conference, are going to have distractions. So... I think Sporting Kansas City can take advantage of that, and they they are not the favorite out west. It's hard to say the LAFC is not the favorite, but Sporting can be right there if Polito gets them 12 to 16 goals. I think that unlocks a lot of different things with this group. So a favorite to possibly have a, a home seed when it comes to the playoff discussion as things lay out right now. Oh, easily. Top four in the West? Yeah, easily. Yeah. So that was, and that was why I wanted to ask because of what we saw from the, the healthy pieces last year of sporting and knowing that the, the youth is going to be there for another year and all of these other elements. And then you bring in someone like Polito that can be the hammer for you. And that was why I wanted to, to lay out the, the situation for sporting and how they looked in the West and where you thought they might end up. Yeah, that's that's not how I would describe Polito, though. I mean, he's he's not the hammer is not the word I would use because he's not just that strong number nine. He's multifaceted, and that fits with what Vermes wants to do. You know, he's a guy who can do different things, and it's not just Polito that's going to benefit from this. It's not like Polito is going to come in and score thirty goals, and nobody else right. is going to get more than five. That's not the point. He makes everybody else better. And that's going to be the key here because you have Gerso, you have Johnny Russell, you have Kyrie Shelton now that you've uh, re-added to your squad. You've got other guys who can score goals. You're not asking Polito to score 30. You're asking him to score you know, between 12 and 16 and probably add another five or six assists on top of that and, and draw some attention away from a Johnny Russell who can cut inside and, and put the ball in the back of the net. That's what you're asking him to do. So hammer, no, it's more of just making all the different pieces work. And that's what they've missed. Now, price tag is debatable. Um, Fox Sports Mexico said $9.5 million. Andrew Wiebe said he's heard that the fee was closer to $6 million. Um, He's guessing it's probably somewhere in between, which is a safe guess. If it's the 9.5, Andy Edwards of The Athletic pointed this out, that would be $5.5 million more than Sporting Kansas City has previously paid in transfer fees combined. So they've paid, when you do the math, $4 million in transfer fees in the club's history. So no matter where this number is, it's more than they've ever paid in all of their transfer fees ever. That's the changing of Major League Soccer. Vermes and the ownership talked about, you know, putting more money into this. And look, you have to. And this was a a really good point that popped up yesterday. You look at the top 20 goal scorers in Major League Soccer last year. Only two of the 20 made less than the maximum budget charge that would make them not a TAM player or a designated player. CJ Sapong, Valentin Castellanos. Castellanos, if he stays in the league, he's going to get that kind of money. Sapong, maybe not at this stage of his career, but that's it. You got to pay. You got to pay for quality up front. 
flat out. You're not going to be able to do it with young kids who haven't earned that contract yet. You're not going to be able to do it with journeymen. If you want goals and you're not winning without goals, you got to pay for them. And that's just the reality of the league at this point. You're not going to be able to do it like Kansas City has tried to since they traded Dom Dwyer. They haven't been able to find the right guy. Pulido and the investment they're putting into him makes you feel like he's the right guy. Yeah. So once again, you know, the the race to Polito now ends in Kansas City, and now those other teams that were chasing Polito, now I want to see where the chess match goes. Is to okay, so we didn't get Polito. Who who is now on our short list that we can try to to bring in and attract? Well, San Jose doesn't roster. need that. No, that's the thing. Is San Jose didn't have to have Polito. San Jose has got Andres Rios, who they signed midseason last year. They're expecting more from him. Danny Hooson, Chris Wondolowski, you've got goal scorers up top for them. Polito would have been a bonus, and his relationship with Matias Almeida would have put that over the top. So San Jose, hey, when you have the chance to get a player like a Polito, even if you've got pieces in those roles now, you kick the tires, you go for it, and that's what San Jose did. They're fine. They're, they're, they can look in different places for upgrades to that roster chicago is a whole different conversation right chicago right now has cj sapong as their leading threat up top they have a midfield that you're looking at with alvaro madron which is a good signing they got right at the end of the season uh probably with brant bronico who had a, a good year but you don't have dax mccarty anymore you don't have bastian schweinsteiger anymore you're looking at frankowski on one wing good you don't have alexander katai anymore Jordy Mihailovic right now has the keys to the car as the number 10, and I think you'd like to continue that. Um, you've got an opening on the left wing, unless you're going to go with Raheem Edwards, which I don't know if that's going to put you over the top. Sapong can play out wide if you want. I think you need a, a, a star number nine. You don't have a right back at the moment, unless you're going to move Bronico over there and play Michael Azira with Madron. Your back line at the moment is Calvo and Kappelhoff as your two center backs. Jonathan Bornstein and or Jeremiah Guchar can, can play on the back line as well. You're just not very good right now if you're Chicago. And you don't have much that's exciting either. Like It's one thing to, to not have a lot of depth. It's one thing to not have, you know, uh, you have some holes in it. But you, you don't have much in this team that, is going to sell tickets. It's exciting. And, oh, yeah, by the way, you're moving back into Soldier Field. Right. So Chicago, now that they don't get Polito, they've got to go out and make a splash. They're in a different boat. San Jose, good player comes along, you can go for it. You don't have to make a splash. Chicago's got to make a splash. There's just no way around it. And almost to the point, and this is going to be the tough thing, if you get the player who makes your team better and a winner and makes a splash, cool. You're at the point with Chicago that you might have to accentuate the splash over the effectiveness. And that's a bad place to be. But there's nothing exciting about the Chicago Fire right now. And, oh, yeah, you've done a rebrand that has not exactly you know, gotten everybody excited. No. So you add that to the mix. It's Polito would have been a great step in the right direction. I think you even got to go bigger than that. So I don't know what Chicago is going to do, but there's not a lot of talk about other possibilities with them at the moment. So uh, it's going to be a, a strange season in Soldier Field as it is currently constructed with the Chicago Fire. There has been some talk out of Chicago about potential general manager hires. They've been linked to FC Basel sporting director George Heights for the sporting director role. What it looks like Chicago is going to do going forward is Nelson Rodriguez is going to focus on the business side. He's going to give up the soccer side of it, which is probably for the best based off the roster that's been put together over the years. And Heights is the one that they have interviewed so far. It's been reported by Guillermo Rivera. Um, he has not worked since the summer of 2017 when he left Basel. So 
I don't exactly know why that's the case, and that would have to be a big question mark. But it's just very quiet in Chicago outside of a a logo change that maybe should have been more quiet. Yes. It's not good. Yep. No, Chicago for me, uh, I see more red flags than anything else right now. You know, you're chasing after folks, you're not getting them. Your rebrand just absolutely went over like a whoopee cushion. And you're not you're not winning the press conference. You're not winning the battle in the, the press releases. And you're not adding to your side in a substantive way. So right now with Chicago, that's like, Strike one, strike two, and we're we're now down the batting order here. You've got multiple outs in the inning, and you got to get you got to get runners on base here. You got to score some runs, and I'm not seeing that right now from the Chicago Fire. You went deep into a baseball analogy on a soccer show. Yes, I did. Kind of a, a deep baseball analogy, not just a uh, got to hit it out of the park with this signing. That, that I think that that you would have probably put me in the. Uh, the uh, penalty box, two minutes for a cliche. No, I'm putting you in the penalty box for a baseball analogy on a soccer show. you got to take that, uh, and this is your challenge right now, take that analogy and make it soccer. Huh. Wow. Take your whole, uh, you got to get runs, runners on base, yada, 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 and, and give me a, a soccer version of that. What you what you what other than having to score goals consistently every time you touch the ball? That's not realistic, and you know that. And that's not what the I know. It's not was, realistic, but that's not what the analogy was. Give me a soccer version of it. Come on, ah oh, man, I'm gonna make you think today. You're gonna throw baseball stuff at me. I'm gonna make you think. Yeah, that's well, that's nothing new. But nah, damn. I feel like I need a commercial break to to think this through. <laughs> He's tapping out. Uh, I am. Well, if it, maybe, it's, it's, maybe you can the hear the li- gears grinding on the show. Uh, maybe the listeners can uh, help you out. Yes, so, uh, improve in. my analogy. Bring it back to soccer, people. Yes, chime in on uh, the Wall Pass Wednesday hashtag. Throw other questions at us as well. We're going to get into some different things this morning. Catch up on the uh, news and rumors from around the league in the next segment. Hang out with us. We'll be right back after this. Looking for future leaders we can trust and believe in? Look no further than the high school student athletes right here in Georgia. High school sports teach young people how to be effective leaders. It begins by making their grades and being on time for practice. It includes learning to listen, following directions, accepting responsibility, being a good role model. And it's about respect for officials, opponents, the rules, and each other. The result? It transcends sports. It gives us hope for the future. High school sports. There's so much more than just a game. This message presented by the Georgia High School Association and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. Today's show is presented by Apolinsky and Associates, personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience, supporters of Atlanta United, Faction, and Inter-Atlanta Youth Football Club. If you've been hurt in a wreck, contact Steve today at steve at aa-legal.com or call in 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Welcome back. Soccer down here, December 11th. I see Tofka's trying to help out with your analogies. We'll come back to that and let everybody marinate on it for a little while. 
Let's get into some news and rumors from around Major League Soccer at the moment. Um, This one just popped up, which is rather interesting that Taylor Twellman would choose to retweet something uh, about an hour and a half ago that was originally posted on November 6th from at Zenit underscore transfer. And I'm not up on, on... other languages, including, uh, ooh, I guess this would be Russian. Um, yeah. Zenit, and according to uh, said translate, and we're going to rely on the Google tools, Inter- this is from November 6th, and Twelman just retweeted it at 90 minutes ago. Uh, according to this tweet, Inter Miami's new MLS team has made an offer for Sebastian Drusi, which was a player that's been linked before the Athletic mentioned his name. And Matthias Kraneviter, they are now the main goals of Inter Miami. For them, the club is ready to pay Zenit thirty million dollars. Wow! Uh, the transition is possible in the winter. So, okay, let's learn about these two players that are being discussed. Uh, Sebastian Drusi is valued on transfer marked at just over eighteen million dollars on his own. He's twenty three years old, plays on the left wing. Originally from Argentina, uh, developed at River Plate, and Zenit in 2017 in the summer window reportedly paid River $17 million to get him. Uh, this season, according to the stats that Transfer Marked has, 21 appearances in all competitions, one goal, one assist. Uh, we, we see it. A lot of times where the the Russian clubs are throwing, Ukrainian clubs as well, throwing big, big money at South American players. And it doesn't always stick because you talk about culture shock. It's not for everybody. No. Uh, Drew C is a player who, you know, according to Transfer Market, again, valued at $18 million. That's up a million and some change from what was reportedly paid for him two years ago, or a year and a half ago. Uh, no, two and a half years ago. Sorry, I can't do math this morning. So, Well, I can't do analogies, so we're even. That's fine, that's fine. That's not a lot of development from Drusy over the last two and a half years. That's a little concerning, and it's understandable why you would want to make that sale. Now, the other player, Matthias Kranovitter. Defensive midfielder, valued on transfer marked at just over four and a half million dollars. He's got nine caps for Argentina. Uh, again, shopping from the Argentine market. Kranovitter went to Zenit from Atletico Madrid in August of 2017. A little over nine million dollars was the fee. Again, this is two and a half years ago, and you're talking about a player who's now 26. Was 23 when that deal happened. Uh, he's barely played this season, according to the stats on transfer mark. So, very interesting. Um, $30 million for these two players based off their values on, on, on transfer mark, which is not 100% accurate. It's, it's not the Bible. Gives you a guide. 30 feels high. Not as much for Drusi, but for Kranovitzer, unless... They're asking for a large amount for Drusy and Inter Miami's like, well, throw in another player and, and we'll do that. Maybe that's the case. If you go back to the athletic article uh, that talked about Roger Martinez, the striker from Club America, and Paul Tenorio had this reporting, you go back to that and Drusy was mentioned, and uh, I'm trying to pull it up. If I remember correctly, the reporting from Tenorio was that Drusy was too expensive. Yes. Uh, sources said Miami's been working to sign Argentine striker, and they've got him as a striker. Transfer Mark has him as a left winger. Um, but they have not been able to get that deal over the line. He can play as a forward or as a winger. Scored 16 goals, 14 assists for Zenit since joining from River in a $17 million transfer. Again, according to the stats, this season, he's only got a goal and an assist. So it, it's slowed down a bit for Drusy. Um, just interesting to me that, that Taylor Twelman is retweeting uh, month-plus-old tweets in Russian mm-hmm. this morning. Yes. 
usually, and hey, he's not always 100% correct. We remember the Patrick Vieira situation, but I don't think this happened by accident. Nope. So okay. we've wondered about Inter Miami. We've wondered what they're going to do. These are two big names. I mean, big signings. Uh, maybe big names might not be the right word. Drusy's a, a fairly big name, but big signings from a big club and players with big pedigree. But player and and the other thing you got to add to it too is young players in Europe who. They're not in one of the big five leagues, but they are looking at this potentially as I can get better by going to Miami. I can get paid by going to Miami, and then I can still go back to Europe. That's the part of it that has really started to open my eyes about where MLS can get to quickly. It's one thing to get Ezekiel Barco, Miguel Almiron, young South American players who haven't been to Europe yet and get them to come get into a bigger shop window sell good that, that's an easier sell that that's that's not outrageous it wasn't outrageous when they pulled it off the first time with Atlanta United it's not outrageous for other clubs to do that and, and others have tried it this is a step beyond because this is this is not even Joseph Martinez coming back from Torino like that's Put that to the side. That might be a, kind of a unique situation where I don't necessarily see him wanting to leave now. These two guys, and especially Drusy at his age, it feels like an opportunity to to kickstart his career that has stalled for a couple of years now. And if MLS can get into this type of situation, we've we've talked about it in what's next, and we've talked about it with you know a lot of people wanting to throw shade about Don Garber saying that. You know, MLS can be one of the top leagues in the world, and people say, oh, they're, they're number 20. They're worse than the championship. When you're getting players from Champions League clubs in Europe, and no, not top five league Champions League clubs, but still Champions League clubs in Europe, considering this kind of move to a brand new team, it's Miami, which is a little bit more buzz than your average brand new team, but it's still a brand new team considering this move for the next step of their career, rather than going to a Spanish team or going to an Italian team or, or even going to a, a Dutch or Belgian team. That's big. I think it's a, just to be in the conversation. This shows progress. And, and this is where I felt like MLS can get to. That next step is to be one of those kinds of leagues in the world where you are graduate school essentially you are finishing off development or you are providing a kickstart a restart to a career for a player to go to a big club after that that's a not a bad spot to be in it's a reasonable spot to get to quickly and then it gives you the opportunity and you know i I think my target for where mls can get to in the next 10 years is the level of france I, I think the French league is the one and, you know, I mean, we've talked about the Italian league and Serie A and the financial problems. Maybe they come back to the pack a little bit because of that. But France is the one that I think MLS can get to that level quickly in the next decade. And, and these are the types of moves that start to get you there. Yeah, this is, this is not the case of, you know, you, you mentioned graduate school chasing after your, your masters. This isn't, a setup where you have athletes who are to continue your analogy, just in school to, to be on the six year plan to, to be on the the seven year plan. You've changed majors a couple of times and you're sitting there and it's like, all right, uh, I think I know what I want to be, you know, pre-law. Well, I thought you were pre-med same thing. No, this is different. And to have these, to have these players sit there and look at a new opportunity in MLS for a chance to further their careers. There are very few clubs really that have taken the, the South American player, created a culture and have given it a chance to succeed and use that stop. That's not on a top five league to get you to Europe. Uh, Shakhtar Donetsk is the, the example that pops into my head because of the, the culture that they've created through 
agents and managers, and they've been that gathering point for South American talent that has gotten them to Champions League. But when you're not in a situation like that, you feel like things are kind of slowing down, and you can consider going to an MLS side, in this case Miami, to get your career in your own mind back on track. I think this is huge for MLS when you're seeing this kind of consideration, even if it is in, in a five-week-old tweet to see this kind of information going forward. I think it's big for the league. Man, the hits keep coming this morning, too. Uh, Oscar Perea is talking on Colombian radio and uh, confirms that Orlando City are in negotiations with Herman Cano. And this is a, another big scoring signing that we've talked about this offseason. Uh, Independiente Medellin has kind of been all over the place in renewing this guy's contract for a few years now. RSL had been sniffing around at one point, but Independiente Medellin has announced that he's leaving the club at the end of the calendar year. MLS had been linked, and now it's Orlando. And when you have a manager with Colombian heritage like Oscar Pereja, mm-hmm. you're going to be able to get into some places that maybe others couldn't. Now, Gano is Argentine, but he's played in Colombia for a long time. You've got probably... Probably some links when you're talking about representation, and that's where this move's going to get started. So, two things that would come up from this: uh, Gano is the player that we've talked about that scored over 30 goals in the last calendar year, and in just a few more appearances than goals scored. I think it was 31 goals and 35 appearances in the last season. Uh, that's a pretty good return on your investment. But there's also a guy that they invested a lot in a few years ago that is their number nine at the moment. Not in the number nine shirt, but number nine. I don't even know if he's number nine in the hearts of Orlando City fans in your anymore, program. Dom Dwyer. No, he's not in the program because he's not wearing the number nine shirt. But Dom Dwyer is there. And where is he going to end up? Because... If Kondo's in this team, he's playing, and Dwyer could be on the market. Does that move that had been rumored uh, back during the expansion draft and all that stuff, does that move of Dom Dwyer to Minnesota happen as a recharge to Dwyer's career? If Kondo ends up in Orlando, Dwyer's ending up on the bench. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. And unless... Now, unless... Pereja is going to look at playing two up top. I don't think Kano's a guy who can play out wide. I could be wrong in that. I know Dwyer's not. But could you see a 3-5-2 or a 4-4-2 out of Oscar Pereja? It's possible. I, I think the midfield that he's put together doesn't lead you to that. Um, 3-5-2, it's... It's possible, but you're going to be leaving somebody out that way. I think four two three one is is what it looks like their squad is being built around. Because if you go into the season, if you're Orlando City and you have Brian Rowe, Joao Moutinho, Robin Janssen, Kamal Miller, Juan as your defense, midfield of Andreas Perea, their new signing on loan from uh, Atletico Nacional, Sebastian Mendez, Mauricio Pereira, as your trio in midfield, Nani on one wing, probably Mueller on the other wing, and Kano up top, it's a good squad. Yep. I, I think if you move to try to get Dwyer into that, to try to go two up top, you're going to be sacrificing something you don't need to. So my guess is if Kano happens, Dwyer is going to be traded, and you'd have to look at Minnesota as a landing spot for him because Adrian Heath, Got a lot out of Dom Dwyer during his time in Orlando in the USL. Does he feel like he can do that again? They have a good relationship. I think Heath has mentioned it, so maybe. Considering, A, that I think Dwyer needs a fresh start. I really do. And I think that if you pair him up, and we've seen this with other players, other sports, and I, c- I could go for my fourth analogy of the morning, but I'm not going to. But Go for it. Pull another uh, sport into it. Pull a hockey analogy for me. No, well, I can't think of a specific player off the top of my head that just, you know, change of, scen- change of scenery is basically what I'm getting into here. And I think that with Not Mark Dwyer, Messier to the Rangers? Is, is that not this analogy? Well, I, 
Messier was considered to be over the hill at that point. Well, <laughs> well. is Dwyer over the hill? Um, have you seen him play in the last couple of seasons? Well, he, he's more like the postman to me, dealing with airmail, but that's just me talking. Hmm. But no, I just, he needs a fresh start. And I think that connecting the dots and sending him to uh, Minnesota to be with Heath, considering what uh, Minnesota has lost, I think that that makes a lot of sense. And hey, you just go. If Kano happens, Dwyer can sit there and it's like, look, get me to Minnesota so I can do what I need to do. That just, it, that makes a lot of sense with when you connect the dots with that. But yeah, I mean, if you, if you bring in Cano and you're Oscar Pereja, I, I, Orlando is going to be a team that you're going to have to look at next season. And it's going to be, they, they will not, if all of these pieces have come together and the pieces that Pereja has already brought in, they will not be at the bottom of the East next year. Oh no, no, no. They're, they're not going to be at the bottom of the East next year. That's a, that's a given. Um, I'm very close to saying Orlando will make the playoffs in 2020. I'm I'm very close. I have a lot of faith in, in Oscar Pereja. Uh, I think he is one of the best managers in this continent and should have been hired by U.S. Soccer, but that's a whole other question. Um, Pereja, <laughs> I think, will get the job done. And if you add a piece like Kano, I, I think you're giving him the pieces to where he, he should get the job done. So... We will see. We'll keep an eye on Orlando and what happens there. A couple news nuggets before we take a break and get to your Wall Pass Wednesday questions and comments on Twitter. Garth Lagerway in Seattle spoke about the Sounders' plans for the Champions League. He said, I think we're going to play our experienced group, by and large, in the Champions League. We're going to respect our opponents that way. And we're going to have to make do with what we can in MLS. I do think we're going to use some of our young players in these first couple months of the season in particular. Hopefully they swim and don't sink. It's not quite that difficult. Um, I think that's a little bit of a overreaction you know, on, a, on a Tuesday from Garth Lagerway. I mean, I don't think you're going to have to play young guys for a couple of months completely, but you're going to have to manage minutes. And and Seattle's an older team. They were an older team last year. Depending on how they replace some of their older players who have now moved on, they could be an older team again. So you're in a different situation, Seattle and Atlanta, based off the age of the squad. You know, Atlanta's core is young still. So guys can go a little bit more. I don't think Atlanta would be that pronounced as Loggerway is, is giving you the impression. I think if Seattle's that much of a pronounced rotation, that might not serve them well either, but that's another nope. topic. I, I yeah. think you've got to balance it. And Seattle, one, just has to get their roster right to have that experienced group because there's still some big holes in it. But does that mean that you're going to get a Danny Leva, you know, and Ocampo Chavez? playing some minutes in MLS early? Yeah, it should. But you shouldn't go with a completely different group in those MLS games if you can help it. That's something that Frank DeBoer's mentioned time and again about doesn't like to make a lot of changes. I think four is kind of his magic number of you don't want to make more changes than that unless he absolutely has to. You can manage that with the schedule that Atlanta has early on. You know, we've, we've mentioned it. That, that schedule's favorable for dealing with your first two rounds of CONCACAF. Now, we don't know what it's going to look like after that. But, you know, opening in Nashville and then Cincinnati at home in between your, your rounds of CONCACAF is it's a good place to be. It's a very good place to be if you're Atlanta United. Cincinnati, I thought this was a really interesting piece that's over at MLSsoccer.com about their investments that have come in and kind of where the FC Cincinnati project is. Uh, their primary owner, Carl Lindner, said, and it's talking about their, they, they went on a push here in the last, I think, six months to a year to raise capital. And, you know, you Talked about the uh, the Forbes valuation after their first year was pretty high, and then Meg Whitman comes in and buys twenty percent of the team, valuing it at five hundred million, which was way above their Forbes valuation. So, you've put this capital into it, you've raised what the expectation is of what FC Cincinnati is worth, but the idea is smart. Lindner says their investment well positions our club to achieve some pretty grand ambitions. 
We always aspire to use soccer as a means to place Cincinnati on the world's stage. With West End Stadium starting to rise from the ground and on pace to be open in 2021, we have an amazing opportunity ahead of us to establish Cincinnati at the heart of American soccer. Now, the way that I think they're intending to do it, he says in this quote, that's the exciting part of what we're doing. To think about FC Cincinnati five years from now, maybe a quarter or a third of the team could be homegrown players. I think the quality of the training facilities continues to support not only in attracting quality talent internationally, but also training the youth. I love that he's putting it this way because it's one thing to add a bunch of capital to go out and spend it on players that you might hit on, you might miss on. It's another to put it into a club to develop your own top players and become a top club that way and place Cincinnati on the world stage. You can do that a couple different ways. You can do what Atlanta's done and spend money and win. You can do what Cincinnati, it sounds like, is intending to do, developing young talent and eventually selling it, taking that Cincinnati badge out into the world. And winning, too. I mean, they obviously want to win, but getting there in a different way. This, to me, shows that there's not one blueprint for how to be successful and build a club in Major League Soccer. Cincinnati's going to do it differently than Atlanta. Doesn't mean they can't be successful at it. For me, just then this is a point that we've made when expansion has come up in MLS and teams come online is like, you do you. Don't get locked into what you see with everybody else. If you have a plan, do your plan. Don't do somebody else's plan thinking that you have to do things a certain way. If you have an idea about your path to success, your path for growth, your path for making uh, an impact in MLS, stick to that plan. Don't freak out because somebody is doing it differently. If you're having to, if you're doing things quote unquote economically and you're building from the ground up as opposed to doing things where you're going to spend money, bring in high price talent, you know, all that kind of stuff. Do you and and don't worry about what everybody else is doing. I think that to me is one of the one of the, the cool aspects of all of this is that you're having teams doing things different ways and proving to those A in the league now and B who might want to be a part of the league later that there are certain ways to do it. No, there isn't just one way to be successful. There isn't just one way to have a pedigree. There isn't just one way to build pieces of history. Do you and don't freak out with everybody else around you. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to get into the Twitter timeline right after this. A ranger station. I'd like to report a bear hug. Okay. I put out my campfire and Smokey Bear hugged me. So you drowned the fire, you stirred it, drowned it again, and felt that it was cold? Uh-huh. Yeah, but he's just letting you know you did good. Bear hug from Smokey Bear. Status update! I'm gonna let you go now. There are many ways to start a fire, but one sure way to put it out. Learn how you can do your part at SmokeyBear.com. Sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service Ad Council and your state forester. As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. This is what matters. This is beyond X's and O's. This is the difference mutual respect makes. This is what character looks like. This is what defines us in Georgia. This is sportsmanship. School sports, it's not the outcome that matters most, but the way the games are played. This message presented by the Georgia High School Association and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. If you've been hurt in a car wreck, contact my friend Steve Apolinski of Apolinski and Associates. He's been representing individuals for over 30 years throughout Georgia and Alabama. Email him at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free.
Welcome back. Soccer Down here, December 11th. Wall Pass Wednesday. We are taking your Wall Pass Wednesday questions, comments, and such. What do we have, John? Going back to yesterday, a lot of folks were thinking about Champions League and all that kind of stuff. But one part that I wanted to get into yesterday that we didn't quite get to make the show was the Atlanta United uh, exhibition in Birmingham to take on the Legion. And we didn't get the chance to mention that on the air because it happened as soon as we went off the air. John Roper wanted to know if there would be any value in having uh, an exhibition against or early season action against Atlanta United to an exhibition season to help things out. Is there any value there? For who? For Atlanta United to have a match against Atlanta United too. They they do it every day. You're not going to do it publicly. There's no need to. But you you do that all the time in training. So it's not something you're going to do publicly because there's nothing to really gain from it. You're, You're better off if you're Atlanta United to play these games. Because at that point in the season, too, I mean, you're talking February. If, if you know, depending on the year, you're going to do them at different times in, in January, February. But you're not completely and utterly defined as Atlanta 1 and Atlanta 2 at that point. So, like, guys who are on first-team deals who might play more for the twos will be in camp, and they might play in this game against Birmingham. Like, you could see George Campbell play a lot of minutes in that game. But then he goes to the twos when when they get started. So it's just it's not something that you normally see. I can't think of anybody else who's really done that. Uh, if you did something like that, it would be more like an open house training session that you wouldn't play in a competitive way because you don't want your own guys hurting one another. Cairo had a, a scheduling thought. He says, uh, couldn't. CONCACAF Champions League teams start a week earlier than the rest. After the schedules may just move their head-to-head matchup to the weekend before the rest of the league begins. Is that too simple? Um, I, there could be restrictions in the CBA on that. So, And honestly, I don't know if that really solves the issue because you get one regular season game in between because that's what it would do, which is not really what you want. It would fall in between the two legs. You know, you'd have to move it up two weeks to play a regular season match before your first leg of CONCACAF, but then you're going to be playing your first leg of CONCACAF on short rest. Do you want to do that, which is more valuable? It, it's A couple weeks isn't going to make a difference. It's the Central American and, and Mexican teams that are starting in early to mid-January where you're getting four or five games under your belt. That's the difference. So they're starting games when the MLS clubs are starting training camp. That's the difference. And, and a week or two is not going to solve it. It's got to be like a month. ATL Eagle is flat out ecstatic to see a local team from MLS playing internationally. Winning is great, but being involved is already such a privilege to watch. Yeah, that's the cool thing about this stuff. We've, we've talked about it a lot with Champions League. It's just exciting to to have you know Matagua like excited about this match and tweeting about it. And now people are you know learning about the Honduran league and and Matagua's history and players who have come from Matagua and, and played in the Honduran national team and played in MLS. You know, Amado Guevara, one of the top players in the early two thousands in MLS, came from Matagua. So it's very cool to see that learning happen and that that's why i love this competition and it's why i wish he had a group stage back in it that made sense it doesn't really with the scheduling when they did the group stage before you did the group stage in the fall and you did the knockouts pretty much like they are now and in the fall it's it's hard for mls teams because you were preparing for the postseason and you're making long trips because you're in a group stage so you've got more teams in it so you're making trips to the caribbean you're making trips to Panama you're you're playing lesser teams than you're playing at this stage it's hard to find the balance I think right now it's probably about as well balanced as it can be to get the most out of it I'd love to see more games but it kind of is what it is at the moment with the large gap between Mexico and MLS and the rest of CONCACAF this is about the best way to do it but these types of opportunities are great and I do think that when League's Cup and, and more competition with Liga MX and MLS happens, 
that's another good thing. Because again, it's it's something different. It gives you a different feel. It's exciting. It. I think a, a soccer season for new fans, especially, it, it probably feels very weird now and and as you're getting used to this where you've got your league you've got the open cup which pulls you away from league but is an important trophy now you've got international competition that pulls you away from the league to have like a a year that has these different peaks and valleys and has these different things that that step into your season there's really nothing like it and it's it's exciting i love it because you know it's one thing when you have that mid-season random match against a, a Colorado, against a team that you don't really have a history with, a, a team that maybe is towards the bottom of the table, and the game doesn't feel like it means a ton. But then you've got an Open Cup game coming out as a knockout game. Then you've got a, a League's Cup game or a game you know, in CONCACAF uh, against somebody completely different than you're used to playing, and the game has a completely different feel. It's exciting. That's why I think the NBA is looking at the, uh, the idea of having that cup competition at the All-Star break. Because it gives the league like a jolt in the arm at that point. It's exciting. It's a it's a smart move for them. It's worked for soccer around the world. It's why you have cup competitions. It's why you have international play. I think the next step for the NBA would be to spearhead a Champions League type of setup. Because you've got enough leagues around the world now that are at a decent level. You have a, a summer Champions League or World Club Cup type of, so- of format. For basketball, they're paying attention and, and they're looking for ways to model what's happening with this. It's it's exciting. It's very cool. If you could teleport, if the schedule worked out, or if you could split yourself in half, if the schedule did not work out, well, I don't want to split myself in half. That'd be bad because well, and you'd also be working at the same time, and you don't want half of your brain in. No. in uh, in one location, you don't want to have half of your brain in Honduras and half of your brain elsewhere. Mm-hmm. If you could, if you could teleport, if you could clone yourself, we're talking multiplicity, and you could watch another first round match in Concacaf Champions League that's on the road, that's not in the United States. Where would you go, Leon? Uh, no, it'd be Olympia in Seattle. Because I think that's going to be one of the better games, or Saprissa in Montreal. I think those are going to be two of the the best matches on the road in this. Leon, I think for me, I, I've seen a lot of Liga MX, not in person, but I, I've seen it more. I, I like the Central American matchups in the round of sixteen, where you're facing teams that you don't know as much about. That's a little more exciting. So that's what I'm going to lean to. Is I would lean to the Seattle Olympia because I think that could be a very surprising series. Okay, just thought I would ask. Also on the board this morning, uh, Bartimus Prime throwing this out here. Atlanta United is 0-2 all-time in stadiums named by BBVA. <laughs> That's kind of funny. I hadn't thought about that. Alex Payson. Interesting conversation about getting to play in some historic stadiums in CONCACAF Champions League. The term genius loci comes to mind. Hopefully over the time, over time, the walls of MBS can soak up some of that energy and spirit. New is comfortable, but tested and soaked in glory is better. It takes time. Yeah, it just takes time because then you have that kind of institutional history and that feeling. And, you know, the, the stadium at Aridiano definitely had that feeling, not just because yep. it's old. It just it had a it had a feel to it. Um, Monterey. Monterey really didn't. It's a newer stadium. It, it it was a cool atmosphere, but it didn't have the same feel. Um, you know, you get different feels in different venues. It's it's Yankee Stadium has a, a cool vibe too because it's freaking Yankee Stadium. Like I'm excited that I've had a chance to go to Yankee Stadium and call a game from Yankee Stadium. I wish it was you know, better set up for soccer, but. Yeah. It's Yankee Stadium. Like it's not the original Yankee Stadium, but it's still Yankee Stadium. Like that's still cool. So, you know, these opportunities, you can't take them for granted. Like it's exciting and to be able to to, you know, have a, a match in Honduras now and and what this can be like for for this cuz you're going to be playing in front of 35,000 like biggest game of the year for Motagua fans. They're going to put everything into that match. It is going to be a cauldron. It's going to be exciting. 
Andy Hollums with a question. With Ajax falling out of Champions League, would Klaus-Jan Huntelaar be a realistic option for a backup striker for Atlanta? Backup for Ajax at this point in his career at 36. Uh, it's, it's not a bad shout. I, I don't know if you can make the money work. That would be the question, is, is what kind of money would it take for that to happen? But that's not a bad idea. Those types of players, and we've mentioned it before when – you know, the the talk is always, you know, an older player gets linked to Atlanta United and it's like, oh, no, that's not what happens. Oh, no, that's not what happens. In general, yes. But I always expected there would come a time where you would need to make a move like that to put you over the top or to have that. Now, the question would be how much time would he realistically be able to expect and think about it over the last three years? Not much. Because Joseph Martinez is not coming out of that lineup, he Joseph and, and some of the you know conversation around Lionel Messi and how Messi hates to be out of the lineup. Like mm-hmm. you, you can't sub Messi. No, he, he's not going to take it well, and you're going to upset him, and you don't want to do that. And if he's playing, he wants to play. Joseph has that kind of feel about him. I mean, think back to 2017 when late in the year after that long run of games playing, you know, three times a week for a long stretch, Tata Martino was subbing Joseph out in the second half of games and he was not happy about it at all and and showed it. You you don't want to create that situation. So if you're adding a guy like Huntelar on paper sounds great. I just don't know if he'd be willing to, play randomly because that's what it would be now early in the season maybe because of CONCACAF maybe you sit Joseph in Nashville or you sit him against Cincinnati maybe you can make that work but in general there's just not going to be a whole lot of minutes for whoever it is that's why I think it's hard to make a signing of that caliber for that kind of role because I just don't think they're going to get to play enough to to be interested in the idea. I mean, the track record's there of how much Joseph has played. I just I don't think that's going to change. We'll get into more Wall Pass Wednesday on the other side of the break. We've got a couple questions that came in earlier in the week that were kind of bigger topics that we're going to dig into next. We're going to get a refresh on the laws of the game changes that other leagues have been playing under, but now MLS will be playing under in 2020 and and what that could mean and what we've seen so far with it. We'll be right back after this. Looking for future leaders we can trust and believe in? Look no further than the high school student athletes right here in Georgia. High school sports teach young people how to be effective leaders. It begins by making their grades and being on time for practice. It includes learning to listen, following directions, Accepting responsibility, being a good role model. And it's about respect for officials, opponents, the rules, and each other. The result? It transcends sports. It gives us hope for the future. High school sports. There's so much more than just a game. This message presented by the Georgia High School Association and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. Today's show is presented by Apolinsky and Associates, personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience, supporters of Atlanta United, Faction, and Inter Atlanta Youth Football Club. If you've been hurt in a wreck, contact Steve today at steve at aa-legal.com or call in 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company. Bloomington, Illinois. 
You're listening to Soccer Down Here Daily on SDH Networks, a division of OSG Sports. Find us at Soccer Down Here on Facebook and Twitter. The time is now the top of the hour. Peep, y'all. Hour number two, Soccer Down Here, December 11th. Jason Longshore, John Nelson with you this morning. We've got rumors out of Columbia. Well, actually, not rumors. Oscar Pereja is telling Colombian Radio that Orlando City is negotiating with Herman Cano. We've got signings in Kansas City uh, blowing their previous transfer spending out of the water, no matter what level it's at. They're, they're spending a whole lot more than they've ever spent in their lives. It's uh, big times for MLS. Uh, one thing to touch on um, for people who aren't as familiar with the Colombian League, Michael Ruiz chimes in. When you talk about Independiente Medellin and Cano, Juan Fernando Quintero had a loan spell at Independiente Medellin while he was on the books of Porto. So, you know, you're, you're talking about one of the bigger clubs. I think the Colombian League is one. It's one I honestly need to to follow a little bit more closely. And having Fanatis, you don't get... It's not the same as the way they do it with Argentina. Like You don't get every match, but you get a lot of them. And it's a league that I need to dig just a little bit deeper into because I think it's one of the next leagues that you're going to see more players come from. You know, Argentina right now, look, the financials are just so good in bringing some of these Argentine players in. That's where you're going to do most of your shopping. Uh, The Colombian League, it's been a little more expensive to do business there in recent years. But I think MLS is in a different position now where they're a little more willing to throw a little more money if, if it's the right player. I mean, you've got two players right now out of Argentina, in Nahuel Barrios, who has been linked to Columbus in the past, a 21-year-old left winger valued at $3.5 million. He's played nearly 50 times for the first team at 21 years old. And then you have the captain of Vela Sarsfield, um, Lautaro Gianetti, who Agustin Saleo, who uh, does reporting on Vela Sarsfield. Saleo is reporting that Gianetti, valued at just under $3 million, is a target to the point that Sporting Kansas City has submitted an offer for him, a 26-year-old center back who's played over 80 times for Velez. Like we mentioned, I think if that happens, they're going to send one of their center backs away. They're going to make a trade. They're going to make a move, whatever. But these are two players who, you look at their pedigree, you would expect that they would both come into MLS and have a big impact for that kind of price tag. You know, three and a half, three million dollars absolutely reasonable and and salary wise you might be able to pull these types of deals off and keep them as tan players cool columbia is another league that i think you're gonna see more shopping done and more more business done with and it's a league that hey i'm i put my hand up it's one that i need to learn more about as well because i think we're just gonna see more and more players come from that league i think at the same time though it's it's part of the The fun aspect for me in learning about all of these different places and all of these players and all of these teams, because, you know, we do it all across the board. It's like, okay, so if this guy is linked in this sport to one of your favorite teams, you're going to want to do some research. You're going to try to figure things out. For me, it's, it's another part of how the, the game is as big as it is, but it's really not as big as it is. And having things like Fanatis, full disclosure, I've signed up. I finally have my subscription. Mm-hmm. But to be able to learn about all these different leagues, all these different players, all these different places, because of the impact that it could have on MLS, I think that's part of the, the fun part of the discovery phase where we are right now with the sport. Now, the question is going to be, can you actually make Fanatis work and well, watch what you want to watch? Well, let's see if we, let's see if we can do that. <laughs> I'm dialing it up right now, so we'll oh, see. Geez. Hey, John will be busy. And the I'm going to try show. and dial up Tay Say. How about that? Sure, it's on right now in front of me. So you know, have at it. Um, one comparison, so people kind of understand that the levels we're talking about here. You look at the Colombian League and Independiente Medellin, and 
again, Transfer Marked is just a guide. Like it, it's not the Bible of any of this, but it's a good guide. It gives you a, a safe bet. I think in some ways transfer marked undervalues the MLS market, but it's getting a lot closer to it now. Independiente Medellin complete squad market value is just under $25 million. Atlanta United is around $66 million. That's one thing to keep in mind, but you're talking about young talent that, as we said with with other leagues like i think mls is a far more appealing place for talent to come to whether it's young talent on the way up like andres perea coming to orlando or a player you know 30 31 who can come in for a big payday and and produce and produce in a very strong league like cano uh jonathan dos santos did an interview with colombian radio here recently and talked about how good the league is and how strong it is that's what a lot of people are saying right now. I thought it was interesting that our, our, our buddy Gustavo in Buenos Aires was talking about Leandro Gonzalez Pires um, on No Todo Pasa on Teise yesterday. And, you know, these guys, uh, Barco was honored at the Independiente game. LGP's on TV, bringing his daughter out on TV. It was, it was very funny. Um, You've got uh, Remetti being honored at Bonfield and hanging out there. You've got these guys, Pitti Martinez, obviously, with Rivers still celebrating their Copa Libertadores win from last year. Pitti's everywhere. These guys are being treated like rock stars playing in MLS, coming back to Argentina. And as Gustavo told us, LGP said, you know, when you come to MLS, you don't ever want to leave because of the lifestyle, because of the quality of just your day to day. I mean, it's not even just the quality of the league, but the quality of the training ground, the quality of everything around it. It is becoming a league of choice. And when these guys go back to their home countries and talk about this, other people are like, hey, I, I want to go there. And then word yep. starts to spread all across South America. But right now it's spreading all across Mexico, too. When you're looking at Polito, Golden Boot winner, coming to MLS, you had the rumors with Macias, even though they didn't seem to make sense. You had the rumors with Lozano. You've had a lot of top players out of Mexico now make the decision to come to MLS instead. These things all start to change, and it's really starting to to change quickly. Did you get uh, Fanatis to work? They're talking about the final four candidates for Boca Juniors. There you go. Good job. All right. Let's get into uh, a topic that Sean Vergara threw at us early in the week. I believe it's actually on the weekend. So, can you discuss how the new laws will affect the play this year in MLS, such as the new handball rule or the goal kick rule, anything with VAR? Okay. So, we have watched, and it's been, it was confusing in the second half of the MLS season because. You might watch a Premier League game in the morning and see referees call handballs one way, and then in MLS see them call it differently that evening in a match. I think, in general, that was one, and that's Mark Geiger calling to yell at us. I think, in general, it was one where the referees kind of evolved the way they saw handling and, and a handball call. In MLS, even over that time, they didn't exactly call it by the new laws of the game, but it started edging in that way. Uh, There's a few things that are going to be different. The biggest one that, in terms of how it will look different is goal kicks. You don't have to have the goal kick leave the penalty area now. You can play it short. We see a few teams around the world take advantage of that. Possession teams are going to do that. Because now, if you are trying to build up out of the back, you don't have to stand on the edge of the 18 and and wait for the pass and have somebody mark you. You can come inside the 18. The other team can't. You can. So you can get that pass short and build up that way. Atlanta's a team that I'll be very curious to see if they take advantage of that. I think they will at times. Uh, I think Atlanta, in general, wants to build out of the back. This gives you a little bit easier start to doing that. Now you make that first pass, then the other team can come in and come after you. You have to be set up properly, and you have to work on this. But and I think that's something Atlanta will work on in preseason. But that's the number one thing that will look really different 
in terms of changes to the laws of the game. Is there anything else you've noticed, John, as you've watched games from around the world that has changed with these new laws of the game? Well, I mean, obviously for me, building out of the back and seeing seeing that a lot and the 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 sideways passing from keepers to defenders to try to, to build out of the back that way. Uh, I know that uh, there's a lot of confusion when it comes to the the handball rule for me is one of the things that really seems to bog folks down as they're watching matches, whether it's watching a Premier League match and translating it to MLS and those kinds of things, and when the rules take effect and in that. So for me, it's the implication of what is a handball, what isn't, and then the uh, the minutia of VAR currently in the Premier League where they're sitting there and they're drawing X, Y, and Z VAR axes. VAR is a whole different no, – VAR, leave VAR to the side. VAR, All right. that's not a change of the laws of the game. And the Premier League does VAR differently than anybody else because they think that they know better than anybody else, and I think they've messed it up quite a bit, although they're starting to correct things a bit. If they had just done VAR like other leagues do, yes, including MLS, I think they wouldn't have had some of the issues that they've had with VAR so far. Anyway, handball, that's one where the law changed, and now the new changes will be different in Major League Soccer. So the Premier League website has a pretty good, very basic breakdown of how this goes now all right one to keep in mind i've seen i've heard a lot of people mess this one up any goal scored or created with the use of the hand or arm will be disallowed this season even if it is accidental so if a if a handling occurs even if it's accidental by an attacking player in creating or scoring a goal handball no goal flat out not defending player, attacking player. Okay? That's the change that has gotten a few people riled up. I, I've seen this play out a few different times in the Premier League. I, I think in general it's it's fairly easy to understand, but it's attacking players. If it's accidental, if the hand helps a goal get scored, it's no goal. It's a handball. Um, now the handball rule does not consider intent by a player. Now, this is in general. It doesn't consider intent. The positioning of the hand and the arm is the bigger change. So before, referees were more focused on intent. Now it's more about positioning. So a couple of things. If the ball hits a player who has made their body unnaturally bigger, then it's a handball. So if it's not a natural position, if it's not part of the silhouette is another one that's been used a lot, then it's a handball. IFAB says that having the hand slash arm above shoulder height is rarely a natural position, and the player is taking a risk by having their hand or arm in that position, including when sliding. So now this is where it, they've they've gotten a little more clarity and... I think it's it's good in part of this. I do th- my personal opinion and and I am not a referee. My personal opinion is the referee should have a little more leeway to judge intent. I I think not all handballs are necessarily created the same and I I'd like for them to be able to have judgment on that. I do like the clarification that if a player has their arm above their shoulder height, has their their hand above the shoulder height, I mean, when I'm running or when I'm walking or when I'm standing. You know, you're not normally flailing, are you? No, it's, it's, not, it's not flailing. We've got to be specific because this is like one of my pet peeves when it comes to this stuff about watching games and, and hearing conversation around it, whether it's in the studio or on a game. Flailing is, is arms going everywhere. That's, that's not where we're at right now. We've got to be very specific in the hand above the shoulder. So when you're jumping, don't put your arms up. IFAB has said specifically that, and you can have the cliche that everybody goes to sometimes, well, you're trying to make yourself bigger. You're trying to protect yourself. No, IFAB said we don't care. If the hand or the arm is above the shoulder, you're probably going to get a handball called against you. Period. If you are sliding and your arm goes 
up above your shoulder, above your body, you're probably going to get a handball called against you, and you should. Now, one thing that has been clarified, and this has come into play multiple times, and this was one that I think did come into play with Leandro Gonzalez Perez's handball in Chicago right after... God, was that the first game after the uh, the break? Second game after the break. It, it was after the laws of the game had changed because we'd watched them play out in the Women's World Cup, but they had not changed in MLS yet. And I think in the new rules, it would not have been called, but it was called under the old laws of the game, where if you are sliding and you have your arm between your body and the ground for support when falling... As long as you're not doing it intentionally to get to the ball to make your body bigger. If you're sliding, you know, you put your arm down. Or you're falling and you're putting your arms down. That's not a handball. That's considered natural, according to IFAB. And we, that's the difference. If you're sliding, arm down to the ground, okay. Arm up above your body, not okay. That's a very important distinction. I've seen that mixed up a lot. Now they're giving the players that leeway on the arm on the ground. A couple other things about deflections, and this is a Premier League thing. I wonder how pro will will determine it. It says, uh, according to the Premier League, Premier League players will be allowed extra leeway when it comes to ricocheted handballs. It's often impossible to avoid contact with the ball if it has deflected off the body of an opponent, teammate, or even another part of the own player. So a handball will not be awarded if the ball touches a player's hand or arm directly from their own head, body, foot, or the head, body, foot of another player who is close or nearby. I want to see how Pro specifies that. That'll be interesting to see how how detailed they get in that specification. That's the handball rule. That's one that there's going to be some things that are different that, that come out of this. So... Uh, a couple others in, in the new laws of the game to keep an eye on. Substitutions, they don't have to leave at the midfield stripe anymore. They can leave at the uh, closest point to leave the field. That's a change. Um, they can leave the field to play at the nearest boundary line. And referees are going to instruct players to do that, especially late in games when teams are using substitutions to try to kill the clock. They're going to say, no, you're not going to march all the way across the field. You're going to go out over there and walk around, and we're going to get back to playing. You're going to see some cards early in MLS for that because players are going to be like, no, I'm going to walk across the field, and I'm going to walk very slowly, and I might pull a hamstring on my walk. You're going to see that happen. Uh, Fine, you get a card. Well, no, you're going to get a card for starting to walk that way. There's a difference. You would get the card for the fake hamstring pull anyway, but now it's not even going to be, no, you're not walking that way. Turn around. You're going right there five steps yep. to your left. Yep. That's the change. That's a big change. Um, the penalty kick thing, I think we've talked about that a ton with goalkeepers having one foot on the line instead of two. I do want to see what pro's instruction is about VAR and watching that. The Premier League made a very specific Rule, not rule, but a guideline to not use video assistant referees to observe the lo- the foot on the line. We saw it early in the Women's World Cup, and then they backed away from it. I think Pro will probably follow the Premier League's lead on that and, and not have their VARs watch for this. I, I'm okay with it. I, I, it's, it's a law. I mean, if we're not going to follow the laws and don't have the law, that law or rewrite the law or, or whatever, have it set up different. But mm, I don't know. It's, it's not, I, I want to see how, how pro handles that. Um, let's see. So drop balls, you don't have contested drop balls anymore. Um, drop balls will be dropped to a player to get the play restarted. If the ball touches the referee and goes into the goal or the team possession changes or a promising attack occurs, a drop ball will be awarded. So in the past, referee's part of the field might take a deflection and you might get an attack out of it and you go and score. Now, if that happens, it's going to be a drop ball instead. That's another one to look for. 
Um, let's see. Those are the big ones. Um, the yellow cards and red cards to to staff, technical staff. So coaches will get yellow cards now and get red cards when they're sent off. Previously, referees did not show. I know in high school they did. High school and college, different rule set altogether. They don't follow IFAB. In the professional game, you did not show cards to coaches until now. MLS, this will be the first time. Who gets the first red card as a coach? <clears throat> Almeida. So that's very possible. Um, yeah, that's a good call. I, I, I can't really argue against that. I think he definitely gets the first yellow card. He, no he might dial it down about the red, but I think he gets the first yellow card for sure. Tata Martino was the first one I saw in the Gold Cup get sent off. He got two yellow cards and he got sent off. That was funny. Um, any questions about laws of the game, send them our way. We will uh, do our best as non-referees to explain it. But those are the changes to look for. It's the goal kick one to me that I think will have the biggest change directly for Atlanta United because I could see them taking advantage of that and playing short on goal yep. kicks within the 18 to be able to build up out of the back. We're going to yep. get back into the Twitter timeline. We've got more Wall Pass Wednesday topics to get to right after this. A ranger station. I'd like to report a bear hug. Okay. I put out my campfire and Smokey Bear hugged me. So you drowned the fire, you stirred it, drowned it again, and felt that it was cold? Uh-huh. Yeah, but he's just letting you know you did good. Bear hug from Smokey Bear. Status update. I'm going to let you go now. There are many ways to start a fire, but one sure way to put it out. Learn how you can do your part at SmokeyBear.com. Sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service Ad Council and your state forester. As a business owner, you know that every year brings new challenges and opportunities. The success of your business demands expertise and focus. And Country Financial can help you keep that focus by helping ensure you have the right insurance protection in place to meet your goals. Jason Wright can help you create a customized insurance plan that has coverages designed just for your business. Give Jason a call at 678-568-6871 or reach him on Facebook at Jason Wright Agency. Coverages vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. This is what matters. This is beyond X's and O's. This is the difference mutual respect makes. This is what character looks like. This is what defines us in Georgia. This is sportsmanship. School sports, it's not the outcome that matters most, but the way the games are played. This message presented by the Georgia High School Association and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. If you've been hurt in a car wreck, contact my friend Steve Apolinski of Apolinski and Associates. He's been representing individuals for over 30 years throughout Georgia and Alabama. Email him at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. Welcome back. Wall Pass Wednesday on Soccer Down here, December 11th edition of the show. We have went down the wormhole of the laws of the game and changes that MLS will see as one of the last leagues to change over because they were in midseason and did not change the laws of the game in midseason, which I think was probably the correct call. Although it created a little bit of confusion at times when you would watch a game from one league and then watch a game from MLS. And it's like, wait a minute, they're, they're calling things differently. And they were. So now we have opened the wormhole and the Swixter has jumped into the wormhole with us. Yes, he has. And I'm, I'm with the Swixter on this. He says the, quote, handball regardless, unquote, rule seems great until it was applied last week in a, quote, dumb luck unquote situation that literally could have disallowed a goal because the ball grazed the wrong arm on the way down intent has to be considered and with a skeptical eye skeptical eye meaning more bias towards intentional act when by an offensive player but this past weekend was almost a farce i i have said it i think since i started seeing this play out in the women's world cup as that was really the first 
big competition with the new laws of the game. We saw it in the Gold Cup and, and Copa America, too. I I know what they're trying to do with the handball rule. I, I get the intent of the changes, but I'm with Swixter. I think intent has to be part of the referee's decision making. I, I don't like the black and white of the new handball rule because it just doesn't account for everything. It doesn't account for everything that can happen, especially on that attacking thing. You know, like that now it is, and, and I, people have confused this with all players. It, it's, I think the, the burden's different for attacking players now. It's, it's very clear in that, all right, if the arm is out and it's away from the body and the ball comes off of it, the only part where you're using any intent is on that you know, deflection or ricochet or whatever, and that's Premier League trying to do that. It's a... Uh, I don't know. It creates a, 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 a difficult situation where you know something can happen accidentally. The player has no control over it. The player didn't intentionally try to gain an advantage, but you take a goal off the board. I don't. I'm not a fan of that. I, I think intent is something the referees have to be able to judge. I mean, if your if your body is contorted and you're trying to change direction quickly to try to figure something out and uh, go a, a sudden direction, I think that you have to look at intent because there are some things that you're trying to do mentally that the body's a little slower in and trying to perform for you. And I think that you should be able to sit there and take those kind of actions into account when you're trying to figure out what someone was doing, what they were trying to do, and, and how it should be implemented. So, well, yeah, I think no, that it should be a part of I'm it. I'm going to put my referee kit on and, and okay. dispute the way you put it because okay. the player does have to take ownership and, and have body control. No doubt. Because if you just say, well, like, well, the player's trying to turn and go a different way, and then the player, like, you know, swung their arm and punched a guy in the face. It, it, it's that's still an issue. Like that, you have to have control. And it's the same thing. I mean, the player has to take ownership over their actions. But there are situations that are accidental. That there's no intent. The player did not try to gain an advantage, but could potentially, under the new laws and the way they've been defined, commit a handling offense. I'm, I'm not a big fan of that. I, I think if if there's intent, if there's any question of intent, and, and yeah, I think it is a high bar. If there's any question of intent, handball, forget it. But I, I would like to see that be more of a directive as opposed to black and white in the laws of the game where referees have to follow it a certain way. That's the it's hard a con- thing. Like, it's a consideration that's uh, like an unwritten consideration, is what you're thinking of? No, it's a written directive. It's not a law of the game. There's a difference between the Premier, like the Premier League, for example, with the whole thing about VAR, video assistant referees, and the foot on the line on penalties. That's a directive from the Premier League. This would be something that you could have a directive about, but you can't because the way the laws of the game are written. The laws of the game are the laws of the game are the laws of the game. That's the way the game is called everywhere in the world. Right. When you start creating what the Premier League did about VAR and penalty kicks, you you start to deviate from the laws of the game a little bit. Now, that's a that's a very specific situation, and that's something new with VAR in general. That's not everywhere, so... It's a little bit of a gray area. All right. This, if, if you created a directive to say, well, yeah, the laws of the game say this now, but we're going to do it this way. Eh, that's, you can't really do. That's, what I'm saying is IFAB, who creates the laws of the game, and the Premier League are involved, or the English FA is involved in this. And I feel like they should have left more gray in the laws of the game And then that would have opened the door for leagues to say more clearly, we are going to call it this way. And that's where it starts to evolve a little bit more. I think they went too far to black and white. And it takes that judgment out and you create some situations that don't feel right. And that's going to be the hardest thing Like as we continue to move forward in the game. And VAR... My opinion on VAR is what it does is it puts a spotlight 
on the laws of the game. And I think so many times when people start yelling about VAR, they're actually yelling about the laws of the game. Yeah. Because all VAR does is it makes it clear what happened in that situation. And a lot of times the complaints are not about judgment of the video assistant referee. It's about, well, I don't like this being the laws of the game, like offside. Like, well, I don't like it being this close and that being offside. Well, then you're offside. You but know, then re, but no, then rewrite the law of the game. Don't yell about the VAR and don't say, well, they should have wiggle room. No, you can't do that. You can't have laws that way. You can't have rules that way. Rewrite the rules. And that can be done. Yes. But that's what it's going to take. What VAR does is it shines that spotlight. And now when you get slow-mo replay and you get different looks at handball situations and all that, you start to see this and like, man, that feels really unfair to the attacking player. They, I don't think they had anything to do with intentionally trying to gain an advantage through a handball in that situation. That doesn't feel right. So maybe what happens, and this is what I'm hoping happens, because, look, let's be real. The, the speed of play, faster than it's ever been in the world of soccer. Technology, better than it's ever been in the world of soccer. We're seeing things that we just couldn't see before. You've got, on the field, one referee, one whistle, two assistant referees with flags that can't stop the play. Now you've got a video assistant referee in a lot of leagues that is helping. You've got a fourth official that's on a headset that can help. But you got one guy with a whistle. It's difficult. What I hope is that now we have VAR, now we're seeing these situations play out more. Now you can sit here and watch 20 different situations in leagues around the world and how referees dealt with it in a 30-minute span. We can make these changes to the laws of the game and updates faster and smarter. And that's what I hope happens. And I hope that IFAB really takes the the line of being i think conservative in making these laws of the game and making things black and white i think handball they kind of overreached a little bit and tried to define it because i mean what's the what's the common line that you've heard so many people say about you know football these days i don't know what a catch is anymore yes siri what's a catch yeah people have used that about handball and that's not a good situation to be in. And then, look, it's always a judgment call, or at least it was. It was always a difficult call. Create the, the definitions that are now in the laws of the game. I'm completely fine with the idea about arm above the shoulders, hand above the shoulders. More often than not, that is intent, trying to make the body bigger. That should be a handball. Completely good with that. Completely good with the definition on the sliding. I'm, I'm fine with a guy's arm on the ground as he's sliding to brace himself. The ball hits it. He's not moving his arm to the ball. He's sliding. Fine with that. I, I like that definition. I like that clarity. I like the idea that player slides and he's got his other arm up. Well, too bad. Put your arm down. Put it on your side. Right. I like that IFAB has made it clear, and this is something that I've heard so many people mess up. IFAB is not telling players to put their arms behind their back. The new way that the, the laws have been written, it's honestly the opposite. They're saying you don't have to do that. If you have your arms down by your side in natural position, we're not going to call a handball against you because you're not trying to make your, yourself bigger. You don't have to put your arms behind your back. Just keep them down. Just keep them in a normal position. That's reasonable. All that's yeah. good. But I don't like some of the now black-white taking intent out of it. Because I think you take all of those guidelines, but say that referees will judge based off of these guidelines and intent of the potential, the player who committed the potential offense. I, if you have that in it, I am 100% on board with the new laws of the game around handball. Joe Bost had a question as well, outside of rules of the game. He said he was catching up on yesterday, and he saw the post about East Atlanta FC, and it brought questions. He said, can you all supply to those, parenthesis me, of low soccer IQ, the hierarchy in youth soccer? Like, oh. Risa has an academy up to U19, question mark. Is the next step a USL League 2? How does Atlanta a United Academy fit, et cetera? Uh I have not done my homework because this seems to change on a six-month basis. It's changed a lot in recent years in this regard. Um, 
let's try to be very, very basic here. And, and I, everybody, I'm, I'm making this clear. This is a very basic explanation uh, of how it works. Not getting into the detail and the differences about Development Academy and ECNL and and Region Three Premier League and uh, the Southern Southeastern Champions League. There's a lot of different things now. There's a ton of different acronyms. The basics of development in house for the most part from the youngest ages up to through what. Georgia soccer has historically called academy, which is as up to the U12 level. That's mostly in-house. And, and my recommendation, and this is just me, is don't travel super far for kids who are under the age of 12. Like it, It's not going to benefit you to drive two hours to train somewhere else. Play, play, play. Get as many touches as possible and build your individual technique because that's what's important at those ages as you get towards the later stage of that lifespan you are going to start to to combine with others but you're not getting deep into tactics at u12 you're playing small side you're, you're not worried about the right back overlapping you're not dealing with that stuff i think sometimes it gets distracted about well we want to win this tournament so we're going to focus on our defense and our organization it's kind of against the grain for the youngest kids. It's all about individual technique and being able to play with others around you combine. That's it. That's simple. Get as many touches, get as many games as possible. Play, play, play. Past that, you do get your differences between recreational play, between classic play, and then higher level competition like the development academy that u.s soccer has created the ecnl which started on the girls side now has boys which is a competitor of the development academy you have regional play you have other competitions outside of state associations and every state does it differently too that's why this is kind of a, a complicated one to have but the basics are you have recreational you have classic which is is supposed to be set to be a higher level than recreational and then you have higher levels than your state classic uh, the development academy was intended by u.s soccer to be the highest level in a lot of places it is in a lot of places it might not be so it's the country's so big there's not in my opinion there's never going to be one blueprint that this is how it looks in georgia this is how it looks in idaho I just don't think that's feasible um, so you have that once you start playing 11 aside, then when you get into the end of that run, now we're seeing, you know, teenagers signed in major league soccer at, you know, larger and larger numbers. I think you will start to see USL championship teams sign teenagers. You're going to see more players decide not to go play in college and go ahead and turn professional more and more and more as it becomes a realistic source of income it's gonna happen i mean it's it's that simple why do players in the nba want to leave school early because they're gonna get paid you know nfl you're gonna get paid baseball you make that decision do i you know, come out of high school and go turn pro or do i go to college you're gonna get paid if you get paid if you're gonna get a good contract you're gonna you're gonna go if you're not you're not gonna go it's that simple but that's going to happen more and more. Now, what's happening, and what I think is a really cool thing, and Rice is doing it, uh, SSA is doing it with USL League 2, MOBA kind of started the other way, more with a League 2 team and is creating the academy underneath it. Georgia Revolution and the NPSL is doing kind of a similar thing where they started with an adult team. Well, actually, Georgia Revolution started at RISA to begin with, so it was like the new East Atlanta FC. But now Georgia Revolution, when they split and moved to Henry County, they had their NPSL team and have created a development system underneath it. And the, the Revolution, we talked about this in the 1v1 yesterday with Scott Redding, uh, the new manager of Georgia Revolution, They've created a little bit different pathway with teams in the ADASL, the Atlanta District Amateur Soccer League, that has young players playing in it. You have players who do play youth and play in the ADASL because it is part of the U.S. Adult Soccer Association. 
you can play in both. But you also have clubs that are now in larger numbers around the country starting from that type of attitude of we don't need to go through youth and do classic and do this or try to do development academy or try to do ECNL. We can play at an adult level and have young players because it's kind of how it works in other countries a lot of times where, you know, if you're good enough, you're old enough, you play. And yeah, teams have levels in their team. Remember Ezekiel Barco at Independiente, he was at like the sixth team or the fifth team in Independiente's development chain and he was promoted to the first team he he skipped a bunch of levels and that turned a bunch of heads and he delivered it's not as as rigid on age for those levels in other countries it's more about level of play you do have some age restrictions but it's not u15 u14 u13 it's not as rigid in that way it's more about quality i think you're going to see more situations like what East Atlanta is doing with RISA, what SSA is doing, what MOBA is doing, what Georgia Revolution are doing especially, because there's a lower bar for entry if you want to start an adult team that is not age-specific. We did this at Soccer in the Streets, and it made sense for where we were because we were not a traditional youth club. I took a group of players that had... You know, we had a lot of programs for younger kids and players who had aged out of that and wanted to still be involved in the program and still had, I think, needs and benefited from being in the program. And since they were older, we were able to do things like, you know, working on resumes together and doing mock job interviews and and guys who wanted to get involved in coaching could do coaches training. Guys who wanted to referee could do referee training. But we did an ADASL team around it because it wasn't age specific because we had some guys who were 17, 18, 19, even 20. And we had some good players who at 14, 15 could hang and played and played minutes. I mean, I, we would go into ADASL games and there were a lot of times where we'd play against guys who were all over 30 and I'd be starting, you know, four high school freshmen. Because they were good enough and they benefited from that format. And it made sense for those guys because the youth game didn't really suit them. They couldn't get to a a club because they didn't live in an area close enough to get to a club. They didn't have transportation in a reliable sense either. And they were able to play with guys in their neighborhood and you kind of created a support system. You know, the older guys helped out with travel, with transportation, and we made it work. There doesn't have to be as rigid of a blueprint anymore. And that's what I think we're starting to see happen more and more. The Revolution are doing it in a pretty unique way with their U21s in the ADASL, U23 team in the ADASL. Their Revolution Reserves is their off-season team that becomes their NPSL team in the summer. Uh, as, As Scott Redding told us yesterday on the 1v1, they're looking at potentially adding a fourth team you know, maybe that's a U19 team that goes into ADASL. You can find different ways. The development pathway, as, as Joe Boss asked at the beginning of all this, it's not one way and, and it's not a closed pathway. There are so many different ways to do it. It's more about how you're developing the players, what kinds of competition you're getting them, because that is a very important part. But how the training is going, what the instructions are, how you're developing the individual player's talent, those are the more important elements of it that sometimes get lost in the sense of winning medals, winning trophies, winning leagues, or feeling like you have to travel to play all these other different types of competition. Sometimes instead of driving three, four hours to play in a tournament or to play a league game, it's better to play the adults in your community and get tested in a completely different way. So that's, I I think what I'm starting to see that I'm really happy about in the game. And and this is more about the Metro Atlanta area is people are thinking outside the box more about the type of competition that they set up for young players and also the way that they develop them. And that's good because there's just not one way to do it. So many different families and kids are in so many different situations. Different neighborhoods have different needs. I mean, you know, it's just, it's not a a one size fits all model anymore. 
And the more people that can find the solution for their specific niche, the more quality players that are going to be developed overall. And, and that's going to be really important. So it's cool to see it. If you haven't had a chance to listen to the, the Scott Redding 1v1, um, Scott was really open and, and detailed in his journey as a player for the Georgia Revolution from day one to now being a manager and the building of the club. It was really eye-opening. It was very cool to uh, to have that conversation with him. And thanks to the the Revs and to Scott for allowing us to uh, make the announcement that, that Scott's the new manager. So don't forget to download the Soccer Down Here app, available iOS and Android. You can listen a bunch of different ways. Find your favorite podcatcher, but download the app and set up your notifications. That's the, the fastest way that you can sit there and say, oh, they've got a new 1v1 with uh, the Georgia Revs, and you get news first and foremost that way. So iOS and Android, and don't forget to like, friend, be a part of our conversation on fi- on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, and YouTube, and SoccerDownHere.net for all the news that's fit to vent about on a daily basis. We got that other stuff. Long venting, so I, I apologize for that long-winded venting, but no, Hopefully, it that's made what some this, sense. That's the what the but that's what this show is about. It's about an education, in as much as it is about the news of the day. And if some folks need, to, if they have questions, and it takes a little while to explain something, that's why that's why we're here, man. I'm going to go get another Red Bull because now I need more energy after that one. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back after this to uh, wrap everything up. Final call for Wall Pass Wednesday questions. Uh, we have some news from Charlotte coming up right after the break. Looking for future leaders we can trust and believe in? Look no further than the high school student-athletes right here in Georgia. High school sports teach young people how to be effective leaders. It begins by making their grades and being on time for practice. It includes learning to listen, following directions, accepting responsibility, being a good role model. And it's about respect for officials, opponents, the rules, and each other. The result? It transcends sports. It gives us hope for the future. High school sports. There's so much more than just a game. This message presented by the Georgia High School Association and the Georgia Athletic Directors Association. Today's show is presented by Apolinsky and Associates, personal injury lawyers with over 30 years of experience, supporters of Atlanta United, Faction, and Inter-Atlanta Youth Football Club. If you've been hurt in a wreck, contact Steve today at steve at aa-legal.com or call him 24-7 at 404-377-9191. The initial consultation is free. We know that every driver is different, and a one-size policy does not fit all. That's why Country Financial offers a variety of discounts, so you get the coverage you need and the savings you deserve. From good driver to good student, multi-policy to multi-car, we've got a discount to suit every driver. Call Jason Wright at 678-568-6871 today to see what you could save. On Facebook at Jason Wright Agency or by phone at 678-568-6871. Discounts vary by state. Policies issued by Country Mutual Insurance Company, Country Preferred Insurance Company, or Country Casualty Insurance Company, Bloomington, Illinois. Welcome back. Final segment. Soccer down here, December 11th. We, we've tried to, to discuss referees in a uh, meaningful way. We've tried to discuss the amalgamation of, of youth soccer in a meaningful way. We, we've tried to be effulgent about it. That was my word of the day. I, I had to use it. Sorry. Um, came across my email. I have a word of the day email. It happens. Amalgamation. My no, effulgent was the uh, word of the day. Effulgent? is just one I like to use, yeah. E-F-U-L-G-E-N-T? You already misspelled it. Is it two Fs? Yes. Okay. E-F, yeah, e- the equivalent of out in Latin, yes. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> I like that you uh, use a dead language to try to spell things. 
It's good yeah, times. Uh, honestly, that that was what the the whole shtick was when I was ordered to take it in high school. They they uh, my my grandfather was like, "You're going to take Latin to help you as a word builder to help you with the SAT," and it does. <laughs> How much does it help you today? Well, effulgent, you know, the EF traditionally is uh, like a spinoff of EX, which is uh, the out preposition in Latin. So out of the kind of uh, – so effulgent. What is, what is the definition? I can break it down for you in Latin real quick. Uh, glowing with a radiant light or shining as if coming from a light. Okay. Examples so, of it, as, as I, I used it, uh, this one would be their effulgent glances revealed the depth of their newfound love. Okay, so yeah, so out of out of the light. Okay, I'm down with that. I get it. I see where it's coming from. <laughs> okay, cool. That yeah. works. All right. Yeah. Uh, here we go. So Twitters. a couple different things to jump into. Uh, one, and we're going to get into this first. Uh, there are some potential trademarks that have been filed for a potential Major League Soccer team in Charlotte, awesome. North Carolina. The trademarks that have been filed, and Neil Morris, who uh, is a great follow if you're not following by Neil Morris, uh, covers soccer in the Triangle area of North Carolina, WRAL sports fan, and he writes for Equalizer Soccer about the women's game as well. Neil noted these trademarks that have been filed last week. Charlotte FC, all right, basic, Charlotte Crown FC, Charlotte Fortune FC, Charlotte Monarchs FC, Charlotte Athletic FC, Charlotte Town FC, Carolina Gliders FC, and All Carolina FC. Those are the trademarks that were applied for last week. Now, Crown, Fortune, Monarchs, you're playing off of the Queen City. Cincinnati yep. might want to fight you, but you're playing off yes. of the Queen City. I, I get it. I'm. I'm. I, I understand it. Charlotte FC, duh. Uh, athletic and town are, are basic ones. I kind of like Charlotte Town. The more that I hear it, Charlotte Town. It's different. I kind of like it. I really do. Um, gliders. I mean, Charlotte's kind of grabbing uh, the Wright brothers' history. I'm guessing with that, and like you're, and you're going from down. you're going from the Charlotte to the coast. That's a bit of a drive. Well, you're Carolina, though, and, and remember, Tepper said it like he wasn't necessarily focused on this team. That's why I'm a little surprised that it's so many Charlottes. He was looking at this team being a Carolina team, not just a Charlotte team. And you do have the Carolina Panthers, which are a Carolina team, not just a Charlotte right. team. So Carolina Gliders, you can do some things with that. I, I'm not ruling it out. All Carolina, like I get where they're going. It doesn't really grab me. Um Charlotte Town, I, more and more and more. I kind of like it. Out of the Charlotte other, Monarchs Town. is the one that I jump on. Why do you keep saying yeah. it that way? Because I mean, because that, that's just how it comes across to me. Charlotte Town, very very authoritative. It's like Alfreton Town. We've seen it. We've seen it in other countries. So no, this <laughs> makes sense. Just, what level is Alfreton Town in? What are you comparing them to? Like a a fifth division team in England now? Are they fifth? Or I think they, so. Or, yeah. Did they, I, are they well, in the I think, conference? Let's let's check real quick because David I know that they've had some fight you over that comparison. They've had they've had some they've had some issues and they've been uh, up and down recently. So I don't know if they're fourth or fifth level, but uh, yeah, Alfred in Town, sixth tier, National League North. See, I tried to give him more credit. You compared him to a sixth team. Why didn't you go Huddersfield Town? Well, Huddersfield Town's probably going to end up in League Two after this season. Well, they're in the championship for now, at least. They're in nineteenth in the championship, but they're at Oof. least in the championship. So yes, uh, so, Hutters, better, 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 more uh, higher level example, yes. But Alfred in town because of their relationship with Fort Worth, the Caros, that was what popped into my head. Ah, uh, maybe uh, Charlotte Town can be a, a better representation of the town teams. Yes, maybe. Hopefully, I, I'm. I think I'm going to vote for Charlotte Town, and I'm probably going to make everybody mad, but that's okay. Charlotte Town Football Club. I mean, what's wrong with that? I'm okay with it. I, I kind of like it. We've got all the cities. Why don't we just go town? Well, Charlotte can yeah. be town. I mean, Charlotte people, I, I'm sure that there will be people with all kinds of uh, slam names and, and people around the country will have all kinds of things to say about it. Embrace it. Have fun. Charlotte town. It is. Come on, David Tepper, make it happen. Charlotte town FC. 
book it. I'm in. What else do we have on Twitter? Unite Chop Rise. We lost six players, re-signed Jeff, Hyman, and bring in Lennon. So just from an 18 selection perspective, we need to sign two or three more depth pieces. Is that accurate? Should we expect more signings, or should I stop getting my hopes up? No, that's kind of where I'm thinking. You know, a couple more depth pieces. Uh, I think you're you're probably a little bit younger and inexperienced at the back end of the 18 than you'd like to be at the moment. So... I keep looking at center back as one, although Lorenowitz can give you cover there. I think a dedicated, you know, depth option at center back would be an obvious pickup. We've talked about a a large body central forward, a number nine, and and like we talked about earlier, I think one who's going to be willing to uh, accept the playing time that they get, which isn't going to be a ton um, unless things go very wrong because of an injury or something. So. I think you're looking for a very specific kind of piece. Those are two. I think you'll see a third goalkeeper added if it's Alec Can coming back or somebody else. So that's three. Those are the ones that I probably look to the most. You could add more depth on the the left side in the back if you want to go there, although Lennon gives you cover there on the left side, but he's primarily a right-sided player. That's another one. Outside of that, I'd... Uh, unless the right player becomes available, which is the mm-hmm. the other thing that I think Atlanta does really well is, you know, if an option happens and it's like, man, this is a good price. This is a player that we, we think very highly of. Mm-hmm. Let's do it. Let's do it. And we'll make it work. I think Atlanta's been good with that, whereas other teams at times have just been, all right, this guy's available. Let's just sign him. And there's not really a plan forward. You end up with eight center backs and you probably only needed four. So that's the Kansas City one. I do want to see how they handle that. If they go and get the uh, the captain from Vela Sarsfield, I don't think they're getting him to come and be the sixth guy on the, the depth chart. So then what are they going to do with the other guys ahead? Like, how are they going to make a move? And they'll have some pieces to trade. They can make a good move and they can make, you know, more additions to that squad. And we'll see if they pull it off. Sometimes you got to be willing. Like, if that guy becomes available, they like him. You're like, man, we're already covered at this position, but I really want this guy in my team. You go do it, and you make the other moves to make it happen. And we could see that happen with Atlanta, too. You know, Atlanta's willing to make those moves if they become available. Clayton Poss, hashtag wall pass Wednesday. How much of a leap does PT take next year, and how much do you think he stands out in CONCACAF Champions League? Also, who is the bigger impact in CCL, Barco or PT? Hmm. Um... I think Pitti takes a big leap because I think now he understands the the style of Major League Soccer. Uh, Nick Leafy nailed it in his comparison of the Diego Maradona documentary. And, and go back to the very specific part where Maradona, in his current voice, is, is talking about his time in Italy, how he had to learn to balance the speed of play and his technique and he had to find that right balance between the two because if he went too fast, he lost his technique, and that's what made him special. If he didn't go fast enough, he couldn't keep up. It's it's finding the balance, and at times, Pity felt out of speed with the rest of the group. So it got better as the year went on. You would expect it to be better from day one this year and get even better as the year goes on. So I think you see that jump. Maradona, year one at Napoli... Very different style of play than what he was accustomed to. He was good, not great. Pity, year one in Atlanta, good, not great. But we're talking about great players that I think have the ability to be great. And you should see more greatness from Pity. Barco, I, I'm, I, maybe I'm the outlier here. I, I think Barco has been great. I think he's been great and limited minutes because of injuries especially in 2019 but i thought barco had some outstanding performances and showed you all of his quality at different points and and with atlanta and with the u20s at the u20 world cup barco is is great as it is and i think that's why you're getting the attention that he's starting to get and i think that's only going to increase as he continues just to get better you know he's still got room to grow but he's great Pity, I think, will have the bigger impact because he will be the bigger jump in terms of output from 2019 to 20. I think Barco's output was great to begin with, and he'll get better, but it's not going to be as big of a jump in one year. Pity 
could be transcendent in 2020 if that progression continues the way that I thought it did as the year went on in 2019. Also on the board this morning, Tom Shrek wants to know if there's any word on how to watch CONCACAF Champions League next year. Uh, no, and I'm not even going to speculate after the madness with the draw. Yeah. <laughs> um, it sh- I mean, I'm, I'm just about positive uh, two-day NA will have it, although I guess they did not have the rights to the draw, so maybe they have not done their rights agreement for 2020 just yet. Uh, could it end up with somebody else? Yeah, it could. Um, uh, Yahoo had the CONCACAF Champions League in English yeah, the, last year. Yes. yes. But don't know if that's a multiple year deal. So I have no idea, and I am afraid to even guess right now. Emery Russell and Michael had had some thoughts about the, the Nashville concerns. Michael linked to the article about where the demolition hasn't started yet and the things have kind of slowed down when it comes to demolition and construction of the proposed stadium. Emory Russell, seeing the news of Nashville's low season ticket numbers is a little alarming. In your mind, is there any way they can create a dramatic increase before the season or should they hope for more season ticket conversions during the season once play has started? Probably the latter because I don't see Nashville as a team that's going to go sign a player that turns everybody's heads and sells a bunch of tickets. I don't think they're going to do that yet. Um, the stadium issue is something that Nashville has to get resolved soon because I think that's having an effect. Uh, Nashville's complicated. You know, I mean, go back to the previous mayor who really drove a lot of stuff home to get this team done. And then she got caught up in in turmoil and controversy and had to leave office. And it was a mess. And that opened up a lot of doors to people who didn't necessarily like the things that she pushed through. And the current mayor is one of those who was not a big fan of the stadium being at the fairgrounds and is now playing a little bit of hardball about different elements of that deal and has not completely ruled out trying to force the stadium to move. And Nashville SC has said that ain't happening. So this is a political minefield right now and that's gonna hurt everything when it comes to public perception and it's a shame because that's been part of it just the challenge of taking a i really don't like to use the term because i think a lot of people use it in a negative sense but a minor league team and making them major league that's a challenge in and of itself because you have been presented one way but now you're trying to change the perception and the presentation. And sometimes that doesn't always happen quickly. I think it's more of the latter of the, the idea of they're going to have to build slowly, which isn't necessarily a bad thing because look, their stadium's not ready yet. Now it could get delayed even further. The idea of them playing at Nissan for two years, maybe stretches further. And I know that's not what they want, but it does give them a little more time to build in a more organic way. What's going to happen, though, what they're going to have to be ready to deal with are the skeptics coming out of the woodwork and pointing and laughing and saying, ha-ha, we told you this would never work. See, look at this crowd. This is not what has happened in Cincinnati. This is not what happened elsewhere. And they're going to have to answer those questions, and they're going to have to build. But I think they can build. It's just going to be a longer process now. They've got to deal with the politics of the stadium issue. They've got to get this stuff handled. Now you've got another element that has come into play at the fairgrounds is the management contract of the Speedway. Uh, The group that had it couldn't pay their bills. They've lost it. Now you have a group coming in and and talking very nice about wanting to bring NASCAR back to the the fairgrounds Mm -hmm. and having to do these things at the track to make it bigger and better and and all these things. And now it's like, okay, well, if you build a stadium and you do the speedway, can you make the fairgrounds work in the way that they have previously? Because that's been the the issue. People fighting, saying, save our fairgrounds, saying that we can't do our flea markets anymore. And, And literally that's what's happening. People are upset because you can't have the flea market in the fairgrounds anymore with differences in parking for the stadium being built for soccer. And people are unhappy about that. Would those people be unhappy if things change for NASCAR? I don't know. That's a different question. And that creates a whole different conversation. 
But if they have to pick, how is it going to get? And then the bigger thing is, look, you made a deal. Like This deal was approved by the city council. The stadium has been approved. Now you're just trying to slow it down. It, it feels like to force the team to say, all right, fine, we'll move. Fine. You don't want us here. The team is saying they're not going to do that. But the city is trying to find ways to slow down the process and maybe make it even more complicated. It's a mess. And that's affecting the, the fan reaction. It is. So you've got to deal with that. You've got to grow organically. You've got to put a good product on the field. You've got to be competitive. If you do that, if you are a good squad, you are going to get people's attention. And it might take longer, and it might be a little bit slower build, but that's what it ultimately comes down to. If they put a good product on the field, people will come. I do think it's that simple, even at Nissan Stadium. But they've got a lot of things they got to overcome right now. Nathan Pugh has a still photo from the Liverpool match yesterday and says, can you explain physics to me? Also, can you push Vale to Barca? Uh, I cannot explain physics because that Mo Salah goal was ridiculous. I did not think that was going to end up in the back of the net. I thought it was going to be a throw. It was ridiculous. Um, the Vela de Barca stuff. So it, this has come up before. This is not new. Jonathan Dos Santos mentioned it in that interview with Colombian Radio that there's an offer on the table for Carlos Vela to go to Barca. I think it was last year, and it might have been this time last year, that Barca had a bunch of injuries, and there was talk about Vela going to Barcelona. And ultimately it didn't happen. I, if this is a new offer, if this is a continuation of the same, I mean, Carlos Vela had a very good career in La Liga. You know, it, it's not, oh, wow, LAFC player out of nowhere is going to go to Barcelona. No, this is a guy that their their knowledge of him is in large part based off his career in La Liga. Uh, he would go to Barcelona and not be a, a starter every day and all those things. But look, it's freaking Barcelona. Like it's kind of it's kind of hard to just say you know no I want to play at L A instead of playing it's at like, Barcelona. Nah, nah, not interested. Barca's calling. Nah, it, it, not going to happen. It's not. That it's Barcelona. Either, but, True. But but no, and and I, I'm. This is why it's not easy. It's not that simple. Barcelona says, well, yeah, well, you're going to come in. You're going to be number 18 on the the game day, and you'll you'll play a little bit. You'll play in. Copa del Rey, and, and you'll, you'll play some. You'll, you'll play in games that don't matter. Does he want that at this point? That's not an easy answer. It's, it's Barcelona. You're going to take the call, and you're going to be interested. But are you going to go and not be the man? I, that's not an easy answer, even if it's Barcelona. Because you know you're not going there to be the man. You know that. That's, that's obvious when you look at that squad. You're not Carlos Vela's not coming in and displacing Griezmann. But how much does he play? Is it going to be worth it to go for him? I don't know. It's not an easy answer. It's a very unique situation. Let's see. Oh, uh, Taka has tried to uh, improve my analogies from this morning, from the okay. first hour. He says... Got to build from the back, set up the proper shot, and hammer it home. Stop goofing off with the ball and shooting from 40 yards out expecting to score. And that was the analogy that you tried to give to baseball of getting people on base and putting runs on the board, correct? Yes. Is that, is that yes, the, that one. The Cliff Notes version of it? Yes, Cliff Notes. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, the, the scoring's different. So, yeah, I, I think Tofka wins the analogy game of the day. That's good. John Nason, hearing the changes proposed for B of A Stadium, Bank of America Stadium in Charlotte, makes me wonder what Mercedes-Benz will look like for the 2026 World Cup and beyond. First issue to address, in his humble opinion, are the sightline issues for sidelines and corners. TV in particular struggles when play heads to the corners. I don't know what you can do. Um, you'd have to change the whole, like, configuration of the lower bowl to yeah, you'd have to shave sections and seats and all that stuff yeah i don't i don't know if you can do it it's not ideal i mean obviously but i don't know if you can change it i don't know how you do it honestly i, I don't know i mean 
you know, you're talking about a different level of commitment with a, a World Cup as opposed to a, a league match, for sure. I mean, we're, we're seeing what they're going to do with the Final Four and taking seats out and then re- and see, putting seats back in and changing the slope of the, the seating bowl and all those kinds of things. I mean, could you do something like that for a World Cup and would it be worth it? I, I don't know if you can. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not so sure because That's literally you're changing expertise. configurations. Unless you do something with the end zones or maybe the club seats, and that's only saving yourself about ten feet, I and that's a curved ten that. feet. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it affects it. I, I think the the corners are the biggest issue, and I don't know how you manage it. I don't know how you can change the slope of the seating in that area to not have that effect but keep the ability to push seats back to widen the field for soccer as opposed to football. Right. That's the element that I just, I don't know if there's a solution to. Alex at Cuppers, I know how bad a lot of the CONCACAF fields are, but would there be any way they would deem Yankee Stadium too narrow to hold a at the Champions match? It's definitely possible. Um, I have not heard any whispers of that happening, but it's it's absolutely possible. So, I don't, I don't know what their solution would be. <laughs> I don't I don't know. Unless you're going to go to uh, Red Bull Arena and play in the enemy's oh. house. And they'd have to probably rent it to you for a whole lot of money. I don't know. There's really not a solution. So, uh, welcome to craziness in CONCACAF at Yankee Stadium. I think it's going to be nuts. Mm-hmm. Chris Kilroy this morning. Wants to know if uh, we think that at U.S. Soccer would make an exception and ever interview Jesse Marsh if he learns English. Oh, jeez. Uh, <laughs> linking to his sp- linking to his halftime speech from yesterday. Yes. It, uh, was it from yesterday or was it an earlier one? Because there's been one that, from a few games ago that was posted that, that got a lot of attention. Marsh had uh, a great run in Champions League. He did well. Uh, he punched above his weight with Red Bull Salzburg. He's dominating in the Austrian league, which isn't really saying all that much um, from a team that has more money than anybody else in the league. Do you have to keep that part in mind? But Champions League was a good performance. Marsh is a little unique in that he is part of an organization that has a very specific way of playing. A national team job is different, and a national team job with the United States would be different. I don't think it's a guarantee that it would work as well, but his success is going to command attention and respect. Now, what I want to see from Marsh, because we've seen what he did at New York, we're seeing what he's doing in Salzburg. I want to see what he does outside of the Red Bull umbrella if he chooses to take a job outside of that umbrella. I mean, in the Red Bull umbrella, the next move for him would be RB Leipzig. That's it. He's at the number two club. Because I, I do think that Red Bull looks at Salzburg as a more important club than New York. And New York fans aren't going to like that, but that's just, I think, the facts. So Marsh at a club outside of the Red Bull umbrella, would he play in a different way? Would he you know, change the style? Would he be able to deal with things in a different way? That's going to be the question. And if he comes to the U.S. national team down the road or, you know, a different club, I mean, Marsh, what he's doing in Europe is going to attract the attention of every league in Europe. Does Marsh get an opportunity in England? Does he decide to go to Germany outside of Red Bull? Does he go somewhere else? That next move for Marsh is going to be fascinating. And especially if it's outside the Red Bull umbrella. Because then I want to see, does he play the exact same way because he buys into that style or does he take elements of it and do more alterations? Because if you go back and, and read some of the conversations about his time in New York, there were times where what he wanted to do was a little different than what Red Bull was doing globally, and, and they had to find some common ground. And I think ultimately Marsh fell in line with the Red Bull idea more than changed it. What would, ha- what would happen when he leaves and goes to a different club as John flutters away into the distance, as you just heard? That's going to do it. That's a, good, uh, that's a good sign that it's been too long. 
So we are going to leave you for the rest of the day. Uh, if you are interested in more content at 2 o'clock on the 92.9 The Game Facebook page, myself and Jimmy Vance will be doing an old school stoppage time, taking a bunch of questions, talking about the latest news around MLS and Atlanta United and anything you guys want to dig into, anything that we've talked about, we want to go deeper into. If you want to throw a special request for a whiteboard chronicles, whatever you want to get into, we can do that at the 92.9 The Game Studios this afternoon on facebook.com slash 929 The Game. We'll be back tomorrow with Thursday thoughts. Potentially a lot of thoughts. You've got Champions League games today. I think you'll start to get more news around MLS. The Pulido deal has been the big one so far. What else are we going to get? Is Inter-Miami going to hire a manager? Is Inter-Miami going to sign one of these big designated players? What else might happen around the league? We'll be back in the morning to talk about all of it. Thanks, y'all. Mucha plata, y'all.